How can you tell when an alibi is scripted? I'm Deception Detective. I'm an attorney trained in statement analysis, and this channel exists to expose lies and manipulation. Before we proceed, please hit the like, subscribe, and notification bell. In today's video, we're going to continue watching an interview that Piers Morgan did with Kate and Jerry McCann. And specifically, we're going to look for signs of scripting. So I'm going to teach you how to notice that um, in TV interviews, as well as scripting in your own life. Um, if someone's trying to lie to you or give you an alibi for something they did, uh, there's some telltale signs. So let's listen. Those, that person or those responsible for taking her are still at large, Piers. And, you know, that's what somebody somewhere be. knows yeah. what's happened. Yeah. And, you know, and we, that must eat you up much more than, you know, f fireside critics saying you should have done this, that, and the other. Yeah. You know, it's not like a double, you know, a double punishment. You know, we have expressed that regret. It doesn't change it. You know, and what we've tried to focus oh, no on one. from day one is what can we do to find Madeline and those responsible. And, you know, if we could go back. If you've seen my previous, uh, previous videos about the McCanns, you know that I think the parents, is my opinion, are responsible for her death in that they scripted the story about discovering the open window, right? So I think that they, specifically, I think Kate administered too much sedative to Madeline and then Madeline died and that they put her in the ocean. So um, when I talk about scripting specifically, we're going to notice the signs that they, as co-conspirators, have scripted their alibi. And I'm going to give you two ways to notice scripting. So when people have committed something bad together, right, even if it's just your kids staying out late or going to a, uh, a sleepover that they didn't have permission for, you will be able to notice the scripted alibi, the scripted excuse. Um and I think I'm going to have some opportunities to touch on these in this next portion of the Piers Morgan interview with them. Go back and jump in the TARDIS, um, we would be there. Mm, I mean, there's no one more than us that I'd want to change what we did that night, mm. obviously, you know. Do you have a lot of regret now, looking back on it? Obviously, not just because Madeline went, but do you think with hindsight, you should have done more to protect them? Do you feel that? Well, obviously, because of what's happened, you know, and I can beat myself up every day, but I can't change it now. I have to go forward and see what I can do now. You have to be careful as well, because I think, um, you know, almost certainly, if we had been dining on the balcony of the apartment, this would not have happened. I'm absolutely clear about that. But child abductions do happen when parents are with their children. People are stolen at resorts and in parks. And there was a case in the UK a few years ago where a little child, a six-year-old girl, I think, was stolen out of the bath while her parents were in the living room. So, you know, the, the, we made a mistake, but the crime is the person taking the child. And, you know, it is, it is incredibly rare, uh, but that's the focus. And that person could strike again, and we need to find them. I want to take a short break. When I come back, I want to talk to you about the moment you discovered that Madeline had gone. Perfect. So I've not watched this interview before, right? In a previous video, if you've watched my McCann's playlist, you know we covered the first 10 minutes of this interview. But... Now we're actually going to hear the part that I think is scripted. So I've been waiting for peers to ask them about the moment they discovered Madeline was missing. So it's perfect timing. And this is the part that I think they scripted, right? So if they did go to the bedroom and find Madeline dead, or if Madeline died while they were still in the bedroom, they would have to script the discovery of her missing. Right. And that's the part I think every time they talk about it sounds scripted. What was the exact moment, let me ask you, Kate, when you realised Madeline had gone? Well, I went back to do a check at 10 o'clock. Um, and I went through the patio doors at the back. Um, 
and I listened for a minute in the living room and it was all quiet. And I just noticed that the, the door to the children's bedroom was quite far open. If you've seen my previous videos about the McCanns, you will notice that Kate has repeated this story every time she's been asked about it, almost verbatim. So the beats are all the same. So far, she we've seen three interviews of her now. We've seen the Sclavin interview. Um, we've seen uh, another one um, with a Spanish television. And now we're seeing them answer almost verbatim the same way with Piers Morgan. So listen closely, and then I'm going to show you why I think this is scripted. And we always leave it just so it's slightly ajar, just to let a little bit of light in. And I thought to myself, um, did Matt leave the door open at half nine? Because uh, Matt checked on them at half nine. Um, and I thought that must be what happened. So I went to, to close over the children's door. And just as I was about to close it, it kind of slammed as if like a gust of wind had shut it. So then I thought, did I leave the patio doors open? So I just checked and they were closed. And then I went back just to open the door again a little. Now, here's what I predict, because this is the same way she's told it every time. She walked into the room and the curtains billowed out at her as if it were a movie. Right? Even if this were a movie, it would take multiple takes for this sort of timing. Right, so she's going to say the curtains bill it out at her, and she noticed uh, the shutters were raised. Right, the window was wide open. Let's see if she says it exactly that same way. A little bit, and just as I was doing that, I just um, I just glanced at Madeline's bed, which was by the wall, and it was really dark, and I couldn't quite make her out. But I just kept looking for what felt like minutes, thinking, you know, where is she? You know. And I see him staff now because normally you'd, you'd think I'd put the light on. But it's that inbuilt thing of don't wake the kids up. Um, and also, last time, she mentioned not turning the light on, right? It's beat for beat. It's like she's reading a script. More specifically, it's like they cooked up a script together. And there are ways to recognize that. So let's let her finish. And then I'll point out the ways you can recognize a scripted story. And then I, I looked and realized she wasn't there. And then I thought, so she'd gone through to our bedroom. Um, but, you know, that day. Oh, yeah, she'd said this last time as well, right? So she looked in the bedroom. She didn't turn on the light. She walked back to her bedroom. And then she went back to the room and noticed the curtains billowing. Explain why the door was open as well. So I just quickly looked in our room and she wasn't there. And that's probably the first time that panic starts to build. So then obviously I ran back into her room and... Um, just as I did that, there was the curtains which were closed just kind of blew open. And as they did that, I noticed that the shutter was up and the window was open. And what did you think in that moment? I thought, and then she's going to say, I knew she was kidnapped, right? Or I knew she'd been taken. The conclusiveness, the alibi, right? Someone's taken her. Bingo. So she's told that story three times now in all three interviews of the McCanns I've analyzed. If you're a member of the channel, I will be dropping these notes in the member section after this video. But here are the short notes. So when people commit a crime together, like I suspect Kate and Jerry have done, what they have to do is they have to align their stories so that they don't contradict each other. And this is what, I'm call, what I call scripting. So they have to not only make sure that they don't contradict themselves when they're telling a story, so they can't self-contradict, but they have the added challenge of not contradicting each other if they were ever to do a separate interview, which is bizarre that I have never seen them do individual interviews. They're always together. So here is how you can tell that a story has been scripted. First of all, genuine stories they have a thing called the reminiscence effect. So when someone tells a genuine story, the more they tell it and the more they have time to reminisce and think about extra details, the more details they add in future tellings of the story. 
So it's called the reminiscence effect. So if someone tells you a story and the second time they repeat it, they add a couple more details. Um, that is a sign that it's a true story, right? So they're no longer in the heat of the moment. They had time to reminisce, to think about other things that they may have noticed. However, when someone scripts a story, specifically with a co-conspirator, you will notice that there are never any added details. And that is because the safest way for co-conspirators to cook up a story is to keep the script fixed, right? So this is our story and we're sticking to it. Because by keeping a story fixed, they reduce the chances that they will contradict each other. As long as none of them are adding extra details, there's no chance that the other one will contradict one of those added details, right? Because um, they've discussed everything they're going to say. Also, by not adding extra details, they limit the chance of saying something that might be, might be contradicted by the evidence later. So extreme consistency is counterintuitively the sign of a scripted story. And the way Kate tells this story is literally beat by beat from mentioning the light switch to, first, first of all, it's from the exact time, right? I checked at 10 o'clock to going into the hallway, noticing the door was slightly more ajar, to going in and not quite seeing Madeline, which is an odd thing to say, right? You either saw her or you didn't. So not quite seeing Madeline in bed. Also, if she had not, if she wasn't sure Madeline was in the bed, why wouldn't she just turn on the light and confirm it, right? So it's a bizarre um, thing to say. But I think it's because they wanted to do this buildup of the window when they scripted the story, right? So she mentions not turning on the light. Then she mentions going to her bedroom. Then she mentions going back to Madeline's bedroom and noticing this perfectly timed billow of curtains and the window open, right? It's literally that beat for beat. And if you've been to my playlist about the McCanns, you should also be able to recite it beat by beat like I just did because you've heard it the exact same way three times now. All right, the second sign of a scripted story is that honest accounts often have bizarre, so unusual, uh, sensory details, right? So they, um, when people are telling a true story, they talk about things that they smelled or felt or noticed that were odd. Whereas scripted stories tend to stick to very familiar locations and include very vague, basic details, right? Like, for example, you'll never notice that Kate mentioned that the uh, she won't mention something like the stuffed animals on the ground or, or any sort of additional kind of strange detail, right? Or that when she was walking through the room, she noticed a man wearing sunglasses at night, right? Just a strange detail that the more you think about it, the more you reminisce, you think, hey, maybe this is important, right? So their story has been consistent across every interview I've seen. Whether the interview was done, uh, we've seen one that was done about around six, month, six months after Madeline was missing to five years later, right? I think this one is um, four or five years later. So it's been exactly the same beat for beat for years, which is a red flag. It means it's scripted. Also, the other thing about honest accounts is that they sometimes include non-self-serving details. So if you saw my video about Christy Mack, uh, you'll know that right, she was accusing her, her boyfriend of nearly killing her. But then she mentioned the detail of him throwing a dog blanket on top of her because he thought she was cold, right? Which is actually a bizarre thing to mention because if someone's trying to kill you, it's very strange for them to do something that's kind of like tender in the midst of, of almost killing you, right? To sort of worry that you're too cold while you're getting struck. So that is a, a bizarre detail. And also it's the sort of detail that does not serve her story. Right. When she was giving this testimony, she was trying to get him locked up for 
for what he did. Yet she mentioned this moment of tenderness, whereas Amber Heard, who was trying to get Johnny Depp locked up, would never include a non-self-serving detail like this. So you'll notice that the McCanns never include any non-self-serving details either. Right, so one way to tell that this story is scripted is the extreme consistency over years with no added details. So there's no reminiscence effect, which is a phenomenon of true stories. And there are no unique, odd, sensory, or even non-self-serving details in the story. And as you'll see here, I predict this is the end of her story, right? So she, she gives her script and now it's going to end, right? This is how it happens every time. So let's listen. She's going to wrap up the story now. You went down to tell Jerry straight away? Yeah, I just, I basically um, quickly whizzed around the apartment in about 15 seconds. I don't know why. In my head, I was just thinking if someone's been in and she's, she's cowering somewhere, I guess is why I did it. And then I just flew out through the back, down the stairs to, to the restaurant. Right, done. It's a tight, neat, familiar script. She didn't do, uh, she didn't go into, into any extreme detail at any point. She didn't include any sensory details at any point. For example, was the, did the room feel cold? You might notice that the room felt a little bit more chilly if the window were open, right? Or a little bit warmer, depending on the temperature. So there's no unique sensory details. It's written like a movie script. So that is one sign of scripting. Also, let's say there, this were the only interview we were analyzing and this were the only part I'd ever seen of them talking. Would this mean that they are liars? No, right? We need multiple signs of deception. So by this point, I've watched um, three interviews. I've done four videos on the McCanns. So I have noticed this pattern, which is why I wanted to make scripting the theme of this video. Because uh, I think that lots of their story is scripted in particular, this segment of her checking the bedroom and discovering that Madeline was gone. And as soon as their table was in sight, I just started screaming, Madeline's gone. And then they all jumped up and were running over saying, she must be there, she must be there. But obviously I, I knew. And Jerry, this is every father's nightmare, every mother's nightmare. But it's, you know, as a father, young girl, and she's gone, what are you thinking? And the first thing that went through to my head, and I said, it was just disbelief. I was saying, she can't be there, she can't be there. And then I... She can't be there. That's weird. Wouldn't he be thinking she is there? Yeah, as a father, a young girl, and she's gone. What are you thinking? Wouldn't you expect him to say she must be there? The first thing that went through to my head, and I said, it was just disbelief. I was saying, she can't be there, she can't be there. And then I was running to the apartment um, with Kate and so we check and she's going to have checked, I've checked she's not there and um, I went into the bedroom and I found it just as Kate described and when I saw that See, I found it just as Kate described no additional details from Jerry he didn't notice a single thing that she didn't notice this is another sign that their story is scripted when people tell true stories, especially to different people, they will notice different things. They'll prioritize different things, right? Two people can watch the exact same car crash and describe it totally differently, even down to the colors of the cars. But when Coast Conspirators script a story, the extreme consistency of the story across time and between each of them is the sign of a scripted story, right? So I hope I'm making that clear. So for example, if you have two kids and um, and they come home late, right? And you say, where were you? Well, we got a flat tire. Uh, the tire got flat. We pulled over to the side of the road. We called AAA and 20 minutes later, AAA came and they replaced tire, and then we came home as soon as we could, and both of our phones were dead. Right? That is a scripted story. Both kids are saying we so that there's no chance 
that one of them was doing something else while the other one, right? Couldn't one kid walk to the gas station while the other kid stayed behind with AAA to make sure the tire got changed? And, you know, what? one goes to the gas station, tries to make a phone call there or borrow a phone. So, but they stuck together because there's less chance of an inconsistency if they're together. And then the story is vague, right? It's very, everything's in order. Nothing strange happened, right? No one came along and offered to change the tire, um, just a random traveler, and they, they shoot them away because the guy seemed kind of weird, right? So there's no unique details. There's no sensory details, right? Did, did, did the car start thumping when the tire was going down? What caused the flat tire, right? So um, that is how you can tell a scripted story in your own life between co-conspirators. When two people tell a story that's extremely logical, and if you ask them to tell it again, it will be exactly the same with no added details or insights or reminiscence about what happened, right? So the story doesn't evolve at all as they recall more things. That is how you can tell it is scripted. Also, I'm sure we've all scripted a story at one point in our lives, right? When we were kids or doing something or had to tell a fib to our parents. And uh, if you think about your own stories that you fabricated, they meet all these criteria, right? You're not going to add a bunch of crazy details to a made up story to do anything to make it less believable, right? So all the things you do to make your fake story vanilla is what we pick up on when we're catching you lying, right? If you're, if you've watched my videos enough and uh, many people swear by binging all my videos, right? So if you watch the comments, if you binge all my videos, you will develop the sixth sense to notice these sorts of things. And now I'm just giving you the vocabulary and the more detailed ways you can pick these things up. But if you've binged all my videos, let me know in the comments, were you able to pick up on the scripted story before this video? I think you will have been able to. Window pushed wide open and the shutter up, which we'd left down the whole week. Um, it was horrible and I, I, I lowered the shutter and I went through the front door and, and I was able to lift the shutter from the outside, which... Do you know that yet? Do you know, is there any evidence how this person came in and that? Well, I mean, there are, there are a number of options and... No actual evidence. There's nothing they could wow. find to say this is unequivocally how this no. person came in. I mean, it's, you know, it's possible they came through the window, they could have come through the patio doors, so though. That was in sight of where we were dining, so I think that's probably less likely. For all we know, they could have had a key. You know, lots of people have stayed in that apartment over There's years to the front door. So there was a report that that morning. Another way you can tell that they're lying is the uh, the uh, conclusiveness of their story, right? So some unknown stranger had to have kidnapped Maddie. Right, so right there, Kate just said lots of people had the key to the apartment. Their friends also had the key to the apartment, right? She mentioned Matt checked on the kids at 930 before she checked at 10. Was Matt ever a suspect? Did she not go down there and accuse Matt? Hey, did you actually check the bedroom to make sure Maddie was there? Because she's not there, right? Or go down and say, Matt, did you take Maddie? Did you take Maddie to your room as some sort of sick joke? Right? There was no accusation of the friends who should be the primary suspects, right? The McCanns are constantly pointing the finger outside of their circle. And that is the alibi, right? If they didn't know what happened to Maddie, they would have curiosity about every potential suspect. But here they're constantly pointing to some random person from years ago who may have had a key or may have come in through the window um, the fact that they're so conclusive about that, while they don't even they don't even point the finger at each other, right? Jerry doesn't say, you know, like Kate, did you have too much to drink and do something weird with Maddie? Um, there's never any finger pointing, which is another sign that they know what happened, right? It's an indicator that they have information outside of what they are telling us, right? They have information outside of the investigation. Morning, Madeline had asked you why you didn't come when she'd been crying. Did that set alarm bells off when she did that? Well, it's one of those things, isn't it, with hindsight? But at the time when she said it, it you know, it did 
you know, we were saying, what, what do you mean, Madeline? You know, kind of. And we were trying to think, you know, was someone upset at bedtime, you know, or at bath time? And we kind of pressed her a bit and said, when was this? And, and she just dropped it and carried on playing. Um, and at that point, I'm thinking, oh, God, I hope she didn't wake up, mm. you know, in between our checks, you know, because I'd hate to think, you know, that, that could have happened and she'd worry that we weren't there. But at the same time, that didn't, to me, just seemed a little bit odd because I thought, yes, it could happen, but it just seemed a bit of a coincidence that we'd check, leave, she'd wake up, get herself back off to sleep, which kids don't often do. So I'm she'd be asleep sure. again before the next. Um, do, do you have any blame that you would attach to the resort itself now, given the time? Of this is a good question. If their kid were actually kidnapped, every hotel employee should be a suspect. You would expect them to be suing the hotel. Let's see if they blame the hotel. Because if they don't, if they insist, you know, this kidnapper had nothing to do with the hotel, that is another red flag, right? It goes back to their conclusiveness that some random third party who no one will ever catch is the one who took Maddie. Time has gone past. <clears throat> No, I mean, I think, you know, the, the person to blame is the person that's taken Madeline. There's no doubt. Oh, that's incredible. That is, as you know, from the video number one, I've been convinced that they know more than they're saying because they are not sophisticated liars. I'm actually surprised um, that they've gotten away with it like this because they're very bad liars, right? And even if they're good liars, the type of lying they're doing is very complicated, right? They have to omit details like finding Maddie dead in the bed while also lying by commission, by describing the open window that wasn't actually open. And they have to coordinate their own stories. So they have to script and keep all these things in mind. So the type of lying they're doing is very complicated and they're not good liars. But that is response right there where they absolve the hotel of any blame is just as big a red flag as them not even allowing for the chance that their friends were suspects, right? That is egregious. That is to me, all the evidence I need to know that they know what actually happened to Maddie. Because if your kid were actually missing, you would only know that you are innocent even before they said, well, other people had the keys to the room. So if they think someone used that key to steal Maddie, then the hotel is negligent. You don't update the locks. People can just keep a key to the room five years later and come back and steal someone's kid. But they absolve the friends, they absolve the hotel, and they absolve each other. It means they know what actually happened. And we predicted her response, right? I predicted her response there based on what would a guilty person say? Because a guilty person would know what happened. So they would know there's no reason to kick up a fuss with the hotel. In fact, the fewer enemies they make, the better. Right? They, then they have less people debating them and pointing the finger back at them. Right? So they're doing ingratiation with the friends and ingratiation with the hotel. So let's listen again. Don't often do. So she'll sure. sleep again <laughs> before the next. Um, do, do you have any blame that you would attach to the resort itself now given the time that's gone past <clears throat> no i mean i think you know the the person to blame is the person that's taken madeline there's no doubt that is all the evidence i need to know that they know what happened to madeline that is the biggest red flag we've seen in this entire series of videos i've done on the mccann's because that person is allegedly unknown to them. How do they know it's not a hotel employee? How do they know it's not the cleaning lady? How do they know it's not a waiter who saw them at dinner and understood that the kids are back in their room and called up his friends and said, hey, we have a, we, we have a kid here. Let's kidnap her. Right? We have an unintended kid. But don't steal all three kids, only steal one, right? There's three kids in the room, but only take one, right? It's just, uh, this is egregious. No doubt about that. And 
You don't need to be a statement analyst to understand how bizarre that answer is and how damning it is. Imagine if your kid went missing and you, let's say they actually believed, right? And you believed your kid, your kid was kidnapped. Would you be saying, well, you know, the hotel had nothing to do with it. My friends had nothing to do with it. You know, it's some random person. I know that much, right? Of course not. Everybody would be a suspect, even your spouse, even your spouse, because Kate allegedly checked the bedroom alone and Matt checked it before her. If I were Jerry, I would say, you know, I love you, Kate, but my daughter is gone and you were the last one in the room with her. So tell me what happened, right? That There's a reason that couples get divorced when their kid goes missing, right? Because it's, it's impossible to be so forgiving and so rational. Right? Or Matt, what did you do with my daughter? But you see none of that. Right? It's a red flag. And it's like everything, like oh, the decision we made, you can argue, well, maybe we should have known about burglaries. Maybe that would have changed our behavior. Um, you know, there have been know. a number of burglaries there? Yeah, there's been quite a lot of burglaries. But do you know how many there had been now? Do you know all the figures for that? No, we're not sure. I mean, it's difficult because uh, we didn't have access to other crimes and things like that, but we know of other people contacting us saying the apartments have been burgled. So one of the real frustrations for you is there have been these... That's strange. This wasn't a burglary. right? So they're really trying to insist that this is some third-party criminal who's unattached to anybody so she will never be found. So don't even dig into the hotel, right? Police, don't even look at the hotel and don't even check the room. Focus on people away from our room, right? It's so clear that they have scripted this alibi of a random cat burglar who took Maddie and vanished into the night. And the, and the way you know it's scripted is because of these things, right? It's the consistency, the lack of unique de details when they told the story but also the conclusiveness. And this is something we've seen with the hoaxers I analyze, right? There is zero curiosity about potential explanations. And when someone has zero curiosity about other potential explanations, about something that's unknown, right? So it'd be different if, um, if, if, uh, for example, someone asked Jerry a question about cardiac surgery and he were, were a cardiac surgeon, then he wouldn't need to, he could just answer the question, right? And be definitive about it and not worry about anybody else's opinion. But their daughter's missing and the perpetrator has not been caught. So there should be a curiosity about every potential suspect, right? Um, just like uh, Bob Gimley when he talked about Bigfoot and they asked him, you know, is it possible that the video took wasn't actually Bigfoot? And he said, no, it was Bigfoot, right? Zero potential that he was being pranked by his friends or that it was, um, you know, anything else except for Bigfoot. That's how you know there's an agenda behind uh, what they're saying, right? Because of the conclusiveness. These two investigating authorities, one in Britain, one in Portugal. Do, Jerry, do you think there is a missing link here? Do, do you believe that if enough time and money and resources is devoted to this, that there's some, that there's some stone that's been left unturned in this investigation? I'm absolutely certain that there are things that could be done um, based on the information that's available to us. Uh, there are multiple areas and lines of inquiry which we think could be explored further. Uh, based on what is in the, the Portuguese file. And I think it's critical, really, that for any major serious unsolved crime, certainly in the UK, a review would be a routine procedure. And that's when someone else comes in and looks at what's been done. And that hasn't been done within Portugal. When the police turned up, what was their initial behaviour like towards you? We, we know that things turned pretty unpleasant quite quickly, but when they first arrived, Regarding the Portuguese police, I think that um, the reason the McCanns don't like them and were so uncooperative with them is because the Portuguese police understood what actually happened. 
right? Like I said, Kate and Jerry McCann are not good liars. I think a detective with any sort of degree of sophistication would be able to tell that that they did it, right? That they have information they're not revealing and that they are likely responsible, right? I think they they were negligent in administering too much sedative to Maddie that night and she died and then they hid the body and disposed of it ultimately in the ocean. And I come to that conclusion based on the leakage that we've seen in previous interviews. So if you haven't seen my previous videos about the McCanns, I suggest you watch them. This one's doing particularly well, 20,000 views already. Um, and watch the evolution of the theory, right? So the things I'm saying here, I'm not pulling out of thin air, right? I've, I've explained my thinking throughout all these videos. Um, so I'm assuming by the time you're watching this one, you have some sort of familiarity with my uh, pedigree in spotting liars and my history of actually catching them, right? So we've done it on the channel in videos you can go watch before people confessed to what they did or were caught for what they did. And I think the McCanns are not particularly good liars. I think this case was a laydown, and I think the Portuguese police knew it. Derived, Kate. Were they sympathetic? Were they helpful? What, what was the mood like? Well, the first police that turned up were what were called GNR police. They weren't the criminal police as such, but of course we didn't, we didn't know the different kind of categories then. Um, and I suppose you've got to bear in mind that we had the language barrier, um, so it's incredibly, incredibly difficult. Um, I, I guess my biggest concern, and it's hard to know if this is because of interpretation, is I didn't feel that they sense the urgency. As like I said, I think there was no urgency because they knew Maddie was already dead. I think the McCanns were able to dupe. I don't think they were able to dupe the British public based on the comments. I think lots of you are on the same page as me. But they were able to dupe the British authorities. And they were actually able to dupe Behavior Panel, which is a YouTube channel much bigger than mine with eight body language experts. And, um, you know, they get a consensus on every analysis, but they believe the McCanns. I don't. Right? I actually think this is a lay down case. And I think people might have been duped by looking at Kate and Jerry and understanding their doctors and looking at how weepy they were when she first went missing. So uh, I think maybe they were able to dupe people by their body language and acting. But if you actually listen to the words like I do, um, they're not sophisticated liars, right? In each of these videos, we've pointed out different techniques you can use to tell that they um, – fabricated part of the story and omitted part of the story, right? So they, they've done a very complicated form of lying, which exposes them to being caught by, um, by people like me. Also, I do think that lots of attorneys in the UK are trained in statement analysis and probably agree with me, but they're not allowed to speak up about this case because it's so politically sensitive. So for example, today, um, I actually analyzed uh, Rebecca Luz, right, who accused David Beckham of, uh, basically who said that she was David Beckham's mistress. And if you follow me on X, you'll see my thoughts about that. I think that whoever her attorney is now is familiar with statement analysis because she says lots of great statement analysis points. So I haven't assessed her initial claims, but her current counsel in the UK is familiar with statement analysis. Um, and it's clear in that interview she did today. So I feel like um, the Portuguese police understood the truth. I feel like uh, lots of my audience understands the truth and the, the British public, as well as probably some people in the, uh, the British legal system. However, it, this case has become so politically sensitive that people are afraid to speak up about it as much as I'd like them to. Um, obviously, I knew my child had been taken, but it's quite hard to... Right, I knew my child had been taken. 
that conclusiveness, right? She's saying at the time when she first spoke with the Portuguese police, she knew her child had been taken. That conclusiveness is the sign of a hoax because Madeline could have run away. She could have fallen into, she could have crawled into an AC duct in the hotel room. She could have hopped off the balcony. Um, she could have wandered into the hallway. A dingo could have stolen her, right? So there are stories from Australia, right, of a dingo actually snatching a baby. And my point is that even the most outlandish, outlandish options should be open to someone who doesn't know what actually happened. However, the McCanns clearly have an agenda. So from day one, they insisted that some unknown person took their child. They did not point the finger at each other. They did not point the finger at their friends. And even now they've absolved the hotel without ever finding the daughter, right? All these should still be open and possible in their minds. It's just, I know I'm beating this point to death, but the conclusive, conclusiveness means that they know what happened, right? They have no genuine curiosity about it. To, to get somebody else to believe that. Um, did, you think, did you think, Jerry, from the start that they, they were suspicious of you? Certainly, and the next day, I had no doubt that you know, we, as the parents, and uh, being there and the last people to see Madeline, that we'd be investigated. I think anyone who's got an inkling. Also, notice how he says we were the last people to see Madeline. I believe that's leakage, right? I believe he is. Uh, he's right, right? He's telling the truth. They were the last people to see her. However, she was probably dead, or she was dead when they last saw her. Because according to Kate's story, Matt was the last person to see Madeline, correct? Didn't she say Matt checked the bedroom at 9.30 and then she checked at 10 and Madeline was gone? So that means that the last time either of them saw Madeline was pri prior to Matt. Actually, that means that if they were the last people to see Madeline... It means that they were the last ones to cart her body off and, and hide it, right? And I believe dispose in the ocean. So like I said, these are not sophisticated liars. If you see my other videos, there's tons of leakage. They reveal so many facts through their word choice and slip-ups that, um, like I said in my first video about them, I feel like we could almost piece together the entire story of what happened, the entire timeline down to who administered the sedatives to Maddie, to who carried her body, to where she was actually disposed of through their leakage alone. And leakage is a phenomenon that happens when you are under stress and they are under a lot of stress with the type of lying they are doing. So uh, it's not far-fetched at all for them to accidentally, through the slip of the tongue, reveal what actually happened because it's a high stress moment in their lives. It's in their memory. And while they are talking to peers, they're actively editing it out. Right? So it's, it's a very complicated process to lie by commission and omission without revealing anything through your word choice or slip of, uh, slip of the tongue. And right there, you just see he slipped the tongue. Of any sort of police. Any policeman worth their salt would have said, what do you mean you were the last person to see Maddie? Wasn't Matt the last person? And it's like I've done a deep dive in this case. I've just analyzed three interviews and I've listened closely to what they've said. So right there, that's a slip up. Any investigator or attorney worth their salt should have pressed him on that. What do you mean you were the last person to see Maddie? Wasn't Matt the last person to see her? Police type investigation knows that's going to happen. So, you know, we went in and gave statements and were happy to help. And things like, you know, what the play, I know. To get somebody else to believe that. Um, did, you think, did you think, Jerry, from the start that they, they were suspicious of you? So listen to the slip up. Pierce doesn't press them. Nobody pressed them on this. Me, a guy who came in 20 years later and only listened to three interviews, is the, is the one who caught this? Certainly, and the next day, I had no doubt that you know, we, as the parents, and uh, being there, and the last people to see Madeline, that we'd be invested. The last people to see Madeline. Could that be an innocent mistake? Yes, of course. But could it also be leakage? Yes, just as likely. That's my point. 
That is a slip up. According to what they said, that is a contradiction. Matt would have been the last person to see Maddie. Based on their own story. Investigated, I think anyone who's got an inkling of any sort of police type investigation knows that's going to happen. So, you know, we went in and gave statements and were happy to help. And things like, you know, what the information we gave about Madeline and what she said that morning, we gave all this information and exactly what we'd done in the hope that it would help. Well, has there ever been any discrepancy between anything that either of you has said, any of your friends that were with you that night? Wow, another good question from Piers. So as you know, if you've seen my Hans Neiman video, I do like Piers. Now, if they say there's never been a discrepancy, that could mean the story scripted. It could mean someone remembered something that the other one didn't remember. So let's see how they answer, right? There's an innocent way to answer this, and there's a, um, a guilty-sounding way to answer this. Has there been anything that if an outside lawyer looked at this, they would say, that doesn't add up. Good. And I am an outside lawyer, and I just showed you something that didn't add up. You have to remember there were nine people in a party here who didn't expect anything of this kind to happen. You know, so if you're talking about inconsistencies of time and being out by five or ten minutes, then I think that's to be expected. I think that'd be normal. I think if it was all you know, tightly One. to the minute, that would be more suspicious but there's no major I think when it what a bizarre answer I think that would be normal that would be more suspicious I think she's sort of showing us their thought process when they cooked up and scripted their story because if someone's telling the truth they don't need to say that would have sound more suspicious right or that would have been normal because they know what they're saying is normal. And if it's suspicious, tough, right? It's the truth. So listen how she answers that. I think that's to be expected. I think that'd be normal. I think if it was all... That would be normal. Why not that is normal, right? I'm telling the truth. Jerry's telling the truth. That's normal, right? Why, why the hypothetical? And like I say, these are not sophisticated liars. So if you believe them... If you believe they're innocent, I've seen some people in the comments say, hey, I, I think they're innocent. You're entitled to your opinion. However, what I suggest you do is read the transcript of this video. So where you can't see Kate's face, you can't see Jerry, you can't hear the cracks in their voice, and you're not influenced by the emotion. And then tell me if the responses to Pierce's questions sound like something that an honest person says. Or even the, if they're actually responsive. Because Piers asked ask them, have there ever been any discrepancies? And once again, they are not answering the exact question that was posed to them. Right? They are answering a hypothetical. They are answering a question that wasn't asked and they're answering it in the hypothetical. Then what I suggest you do is go watch my video. Go watch my playlist of honesty benchmarks, right? So these are people who I believe are telling the truth. And this one has actually been proven to be telling the truth. Christy Mack, what does a real accuser sound like? Or this one, uh, what does a real victim sound like? Listen to those and then tell me if you still believe the McCanns, right? So if you've watched all my McCann's video and you still believe that they are 100% innocent, nothing I say will convince you. However, the whole point of my channel is to expose liars and manipulators. So I do want you to eventually see the light or at least understand my opinion. So I would say, A, try just reading the transcript so you're not influenced by the body language. And I think that's how the, the uh, behavior panel was duped through body language focusing too much on something that's very easy to fake, which is acting. And then listen to two people who I believe are telling the truth and then compare. Right? And you'll notice a stark difference. You know, tightly One. to the minute that I'd 
be more suspicious, but there's no major. I think one of the best examples of an inconsistency is when I came out the apartment having checked Madeline about five past nine, um, I was going back to the, the tapas area and I saw one of the guys who I'd played tennis with and he was walking up the opposite side of the road with his child and Jane walked up um, and saw us but I'm adamant that it was on the other side of the road and Jane's adamant and in fact uh, the other guy were adamant it was on that side of the road. So two people saying one thing, I'm saying another. Right, so that is a sign. Um, that is a sign of a true story. Right, the, the strange detail, and it's not self-serving. So I believe that when he saw these people outside the apartment, that could all be true. What I and I think Pierce are really asking, are there any inconsistencies between you, Jerry, and Kate regarding what happened with Madeline? Not inconsistencies between you and other witnesses about things outside of that bedroom. All right, so I, I believe this is a true answer, right? Because it has an odd detail. It's not self-serving. It's perfectly plausible. People make these types of visual mistakes all the time, and which makes it even more stark that Jerry and Kate never contradict each other, right? And, and like I said, the whole point of this video is to show you how to notice their scripting. The key thing is it happened and I can't say, well, well, maybe I did cross the road. You know, my memory says it was the other side of the road. And the British police are pretty clear about this, that you get these sorts of inconsistencies all the time because no. Right. So even he's familiar, there should be inconsistencies. Yet have he and Kate ever said anything inconsistent with each other? I don't think they have. Right. And that is, um, like I said, the sign of scripting, the extreme consistency across time and between stories of co-conspirators. No one's writing down as you're sitting having no, a dinner. And also, as Kate said, if it was all completely in agreement about every tiny detail, that, to me, would seem more oh, suspicious. Abs yeah, absolutely. Well, we right, so they're admitting that, yet they are, in fact, completely in agreement about every single detail between each other. Right? I think Piers is also suspicious. I think he just called them out, but they don't even realize it. When we come back, I want to talk to you about the moment that you realized for the first time that the Portuguese police were not looking for anybody else in connection with Madness's disappearance. They were looking at you. When the mood began to change for the first time that the Portuguese police were not looking for anybody else in connection with Madness's disappearance, they were looking at you. All right, so we've watched another 10 minutes of this interview. I think this is a very content-rich interview, so we can break this up into a third video. Until next time, stay true.